The Japanese markets are trading higher, as are the Korean markets. On the Nifty Bank, yesterday's low, which is 48,380, should not break on the downside. Companies reported a strong set of numbers in Q4 of 5.24. So they've upgraded the stock now to buy from neutral, and they've raised their target price to uh, 3,050, a potential 24% upside. You know, the first trades are up 80 points in the Nifty. 22,572 is where we are starting. You know, maybe uh, from here on, uh, uh, you know, the mid cap and small caps uh, could possibly take a bit of a breather. Insurance broking. We've tied up with Bupa. And with this, I think the revenue will certainly grow. Bulls are trying to maintain an even Steven around this month. I'm giving you a forecast as usual, but as I said, I'll still maintain a cautious optimism. Employee cost was higher, the gross margins as well did see some bit of compression. Northwestern India is expected to have a normal monsoon as far as rainfall is concerned. Very volatile. Wix is where, uh, you know, it's at a multi-year high and that's where all the worry is. Sharpest strategies, top market trends, unmatched perspectives, the trading day's most comprehensive roundup. Stay ahead with NSE Closing Bell, broadcasting live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswald Studios in Mumbai. Okay, it is choppy out there. As we were walking in 10 minutes back, the market was looking much better with a 100-plus point kind of gain, but that's now whittled down to some 40 on the Nifty. So, you know, uh, unable to hold on to the gains. This is, of course, Closing Bell. We are coming to you live from the CNBC TV 18, Moti Loosfal Studios. I'm Prashant. With me, my colleagues Reema and Surabhi, and Nigel is joining in from the newsroom. Guys, hi, good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Choppy, but I guess it's in the 150 range. That's, that's all the sort of bandwidth the Nifty has been in, right? as the guessing games continue on uh, which way this is heading ahead of the exit polls. And I think as long as we hold on to that 20-day moving average on the Nifty or even yesterday's low, which is closer to 22,400, you would still say this is range-bound and just some nerves before the final day, the final countdown now. Okay? <laughs> Two final days, right? Tomorrow yeah. is the, what, what do they call it? Uh, the penultimate round. No, going up, there used to be pre boards and then boards. Right? <laughs> pre boards and prelims. Prelims. Yeah. prelims. That's what pre they used to call. Prelims. prelims. At okay, least. In Delhi, it used to be the CPSC board used to be. Uh, pre CPSC was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, I mean, uh, you know, it is a case of uh, a bit of nerves, and why not? It's a big one. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was just, I mean, in the broader market, there is no problem, I must say. It's not as if advanced decline is wildly one way. It's actually pretty, even, not even Stevens, uh, in favor of advances, but not by a whole uh, whole lot, de uh, you know, a whole lot. But the fact is, if you just look at the stocks which are going up and down, uh, you know, on the upside, there's a lot more volume, a lot of action. And on the downside, I mean, it's actually a pretty short list of volume losers. So I think that gives one uh, some comfort about generally the tilt of the market, which is still uh, seemingly, uh, you know, looking a little more constructive. So uh, that's the point. Now, uh, for, the, uh, for, the, for the Nifty, I mean, you know, I said this yesterday in the afternoon as well, this morning as well, that at least on hourly uh, indicators, the market is looking oversold, was looking oversold, and we got a bounce, but as I said, unable to sustain just around the 22,512 level, which is about 30 points away from the 20-day moving average, uh, you know, around where we closed yesterday. So let's see if we do get a move into the last 60 minutes or so. Hormuz was just uh, sort of telling us that there's a that MSCI adjustment towards the last 30 minutes. Vivek has been talking about that, so maybe that causes something. Uh, but otherwise, it's not very much. Bank Nifty is doing a little better, I think, continuing the recovery, but that also has come off from the day's high by a, quite a bit. Sectorally, it's been a bit of a flip-flop. Look at what's happening with metals. One day up, down, uh, up today. Real estate, PSU, so a whole lot deal to talk about. But in terms of takeaway, in terms of a firm trend, I think that will really emerge once we, once we have these results out of the way. And at least we, do, we get a start towards that tomorrow with the exit polls. Rima. Well, that's the first stick of the Nifty now in the red. So the Nifty, sorry, the Sensex is now down close to about 10-odd points. And the Nifty gains are just three points. So on the verge of breaking into the red now, and the Nifty is below uh, 22,500. The level we are watching immediately will be the 20-day moving average, which is 22,475. That's the level to watch. And the second one will be yesterday's low, 22,417. At one point of time, the Nifty had almost recovered and was above 22,600. But rapidly, uh, the gains have been eroded in the last 30 minutes. That said, there have been a few heavyweights which have fought for the bulls this week. So even as the Nifty has lost 1.5% so far this week, l and is up. Uh, HDFC Bank has, has gained close to about 1%. So that's where uh, you know, the gains have come through. 
Titan, on the other hand, is under pressure. That analyst day is underway currently, and Titan has lost 4.5% this week. But lots of queues lined up over the next 48 hours. It starts with the MSCI rebalance, where India is likely to see inflows of about $2 billion. Tomorrow, you've got the auto sales numbers and plus the exit polls, which is likely to trickle in the numbers about 6.37 p.m. So the next... Uh, 30 hours, very crucial. Oh, absolutely. So let's see, I mean, uh, what sort of positions people go back home with or whether this just becomes even more quieter. But I must say that, uh, you know, some stocks and sectors really stand out and the Adani group would be one of them this afternoon. Look at the way these stocks are flying. Uh, of course, Adani Enterprises on the Nifty is uh, soaring 6%. Uh, Adani Ports is up about 4%. So Ports, Enterprises, yes. But look at the other names. But Adani Power, 11% higher right now on that stock. Look at Total Gas up about 9%. I mean, across the board, uh, ACC, Ambuja, Dani, Wilmar, all of the listed entities of the Adani group are uh, really flying this afternoon. So that's one clear trend that uh, stays out. Other than that, it's been uh, more stock-specific, of course. Uh, PB Fintech, for instance, is uh, having a, a fantastic afternoon, 5% on the upside, looking good. There are some PSU stocks. BEML is uh, more noticeable than the others this afternoon. Good move, 5% move on uh, BEML as well. So... That's how it's uh, playing out. Other than that, some final like, sort of last tail end earnings reactions coming through. Like, of course, Nigel was telling us about Wellspun Corp. Stocks been under pressure right from the beginning of the day. Uh, so those are some of the reactions. But otherwise, on the index, very quiet. Uh, Nigel, I'm not sure who will be the brave hearts who leave uh, positions open on the index and then come back on Monday morning. Well, that's right. You know, so as you said, the markets are quite as of now because, you know, it's virtually unmoved. As we speak, Nifty is flat. I think it's three or four points uh, down. But I think in the next 60 minutes, either we'll be 100 points up or 100 points down. So let's see uh, how that goes. But some money is being taken off the table. And I say that because just take a look at a few stocks and my director will pull that up for you on the screen. Mask on Doc, you know, pull up the interday chart out there. The stock has suddenly, uh, you know, come to the low point of the day. It's corrected close to four and a half percent from the high point of the day. Interday chart comes up for you. NCC, that's another stock that I think is up 15-16% in the last 25 days or so. NCC has suddenly moved to the low point of the day. So that's another one that I'm looking at. And Exide. So some of these stocks, you know, where there have been good profits uh, been already been made, there is some money being taken off the table. Just wanted to highlight a few of these names. On the flip side, though, you have Trent. You know, that stock, I recall, was down 3% approximately earlier today. That's moved into the green. And United Beauties as well. There's another dry day next week. And uh, that stock is up close to around a percent. Well, let's find out how do you trade the index. Kush Boda joins in. Hi, Kush. Uh, good afternoon. Well, we're getting into a weekend, but it's going to be an action-packed weekend. We have the PCA data. We have, uh, you know, the OPEC meet. And also we have the exit polls. For now, the Nifty is as flat as can be. So if you didn't trade till now and you want to trade the Nifty, Kush is here to help us out. Kush, tell us what's the trade. Hey, hi, Nigel. I think today is the first time, perhaps in a long time, that the entire nation is feeling like, you know, their movie is about to release on a Friday evening or a Friday afternoon, right? Uh, that's the kind of nervousness on the street as well. It's a good thing that the index has perhaps flattened out. It's not a compulsory thing to go out and take a trade. But if you were to, uh, then I, I, I would still suggest that, you know, the way to go about would be on the long side. Now, we found it a little difficult to come up with a strategy because the premiums are very high. So you can't just go out and buy options. You know, perhaps selling might also be a bit risky. I think the best way to play this from a strategy perspective is to buy the Nifty June future and then hedge them with, uh, you know, the 22,200 strike price put option for the 6th June expiry. I think that's the best way. On the upside, the Nifty could move as high as perhaps, you know, 300 or perhaps 400 points as well. And the DK in the uh, put option premium will perhaps cover you or rather the up move, uh, you know, will cover you for the DK in the premium on the put option. So that's the best strategy to play uh, the markets right now. I think for the near term, uh, I was listening, uh, you know, earlier, 20 to 400, yes, is a, is a very good support. On the bank nifty also, 48,800 is the threshold that we're watching for. Even with the profit booking coming in, the bank nifty is holding above that 48,800 mark, which is a very good sign from, you know, our perspective. 49,500, 50,000, still the levels to watch for on bank nifty. Okay, uh, let's get... Okay, before that, uh, before we get to the auto sales and what the street is expecting, you want to fill us in with your picks? Sure, uh, you know, a couple of them, and this is you know me looking beyond the fourth of June as well. These stocks, even if in any kind of dip gets stuck in your portfolio, then you know it should not be too much of a worry. First one is Jyoti CNC. The stock been you know kind of counter uh, trend, you know contra trend to what the market is doing. It's hit the upper circuit even today. Some profit booking from there on, but you know one zero five zero one zero nine zero other levels to look at from a near term perspective. Nine fifty is a stop loss. 
Hudko, another stock that has been doing well. I think this one just waiting for the hangover to uh, you know get uh, get done and then you know move higher. 285, 299, other levels to look at. 255 is a good support zone, so that should act as your stop loss. Okay, all right, got it, Kush. Thank you very much for the trades. We'll come back to you in a bit uh, to get a final check. But uh, let's focus on the next queue for the market. Obviously, the next queue is the election. We're trying to find you other queues that will also be important once we're past the 4th of June. Of course, auto sales numbers will be coming out tomorrow. Sonia is here with the expectations this time around. Sonia, fill us in. Well, thanks a lot for that. As you rightly pointed out, auto sales numbers for the month of May coming out tomorrow. Now, the inventory at dealerships is rising. So the sense we get from a lot of analysts is that auto OEMs are likely to slow production if demand does not pick up proportionally. But, uh, you know, the above average uh, monsoon prediction that has come through uh, will drive the farm income and will benefit demand for uh, two-wheelers. So that is the expectation. Commercial vehicle sales are also likely to grow in double digits. Uh, names like Ashok Leyland have reported good numbers. The commentary from the management has been good. So that is a stock I'm watching out for as well. And tractor sales could continue to remain flat. The monsoon predictions are positive, but then there are elections as well. So demand could be hit. Let's go through a couple of estimates. Nomura has put out this report. First, in the commercial vehicle space, it is Ashok Leyland that will see a double-digit growth of 10.5%. Tata Motors could be about 9.1%. If you move to the auto space, m and Auto Division, because of the growth in SUVs, will see a very strong growth of almost 23%. Tractors could be under pressure, down about 3 odd percent, while Maruti is expected to have an absolutely flat move, considering that the entry-level car segment is still under pressure. Out of the uh, two-wheeler space, the best performer will be uh, TVS Motor in terms of growth. So 16.5% growth is what we're looking at. Bajaj Auto will also continue to grow with almost a 4% growth year on year, while Hero Motor Corp will be absolutely flat. So mixed bag expected this time around, but my eye is on the commercial vehicle space, especially on names like Ashok Leyland, considering the good traction that we've seen so far. Thank you very much for that. Prakash Tiwan is now with us. Uh, Prakash, come in on the CV expectation. Tata Motors sounded a downbeat, you know, downbeat mood when they came out with the Q4 numbers, but Ashok Leyland sounded a lot more confident about demand. No, absolutely, but uh, the way the way things look right now, <coughs> Riba, the way things look right now, I think uh, both of them probably will have to wait for the for the demand recovery within uh, within the CV cycle to really show its true colors, and and that would probably be in the second half of FY25. But yes, I do agree. Ashok Leland, the management was on the channel a couple of days back and they really sounded very confident and sorted in terms of what they're looking at. But, you know, I'll also go back to the Tata Motors commentary. While it was extremely cautionary uh, and, and uh, downbeat of sorts, I don't think uh, the business is so bad at this point in time. And at uh, sub-1000 levels, you're actually penciling in a very small contribution from the CV uh, back. So, you know, all of this salience that we've seen in Tata Motors has been attributable to the JLR uh, and, and, of course, the domestic TV side. There's nothing much from the CV side that's really contributed, but it will eventually start showing. So, I would, if I had to play the CV cycle and not just go by the numbers for the month of May, I would definitely look at Tata Motors uh, even at this point in time. Okay, all right. Uh, hi, Prakash. Good afternoon. I wanted your view on Bellspun Corp. But first, let's just tell our viewers what went on and why that stock is under pressure. The stock has already seen a big, big rally, and these numbers were a little bit disappointing. So there was a degrowth on the EBITDA front. On the EBITDA margins, it came at around 7% odd, which compares with around double-digit margins. What went wrong? Well, you have the gross margins that came under pressure, and you had employee costs as well went up. The management also joined us here on CNBC TV18, and they said that the product mix was in favor. So in all probability, they could have uh, executed a higher number of low margin uh, businesses, maybe the water business as well. And the US business had a shutdown for some part of the past quarter. Because of that, the margins were under pressure. The other point is that the profit number, well, that went up by close to 20%. You'll see how come the EBITDA number was down, but yet the profit number is up. That's because the other, ex uh, other income was up, the finance cost was down, and also they have a subsidiary in Saudi Arabia. Out there, they have close to 30% odd, and the profitability of there did improve. So that's why the profit of the associate did get accounted out there. It explains why the profit number was up. The debt number has come down drastically from around 1,300 crores to around 300 crores. But what the, manage what, uh, the management guided for was around 17,000 crores with 1,700 crores of EBITDA. It seems the street wanted a little more aggressive uh, guidance on that front. But what the management told us was that this is the guidance that they're laying out as of now. There's a possibility that they could look at revising it at some part, uh, you know, of uh, the second half of the year. For now, they said go with this guidance, but there's a possibility that things could uh, bounce back later on in the year. Put all that together, the stock is down 
close to around 8% approximately. Prakash, what do you make of Wellspun Corp? They're in the right segments, you know, in the pipes. They're also getting into ductile pipes. There'll be a spinner that'll come in because later on, they'll be getting into, you know, stainless steel pipes as well, which could be higher yeah. margin business. Uh, at these prices, what would you do with the stock? No, absolutely. I think uh, not just the right space. You know, some of the triggers that uh, come along with this story, uh, particularly this recent acquisition that they made at a very attractive uh, cost, that will start playing out. Uh, and and remember, uh, it's a business that has expanded every year in terms of its capacity and product mix. So it will keep on having these uh, you know moves which are slightly erratic or sporadic. But uh, if you look at the three-year, four-year story and, and, and the way some of the other optionalities in terms of their oil fields and all of that will start panning out, I think uh, it, it's definitely worth a buy. In fact, these are days where you actually get some of these good names uh, to buy into. Otherwise, you know, today, 9-10% doesn't make a big difference in the long run. But on the back of something is not, uh, which is more temporal than permanent, it definitely makes a lot of sense. So I would, I would definitely believe people would. I'm looking at uh, some of the. Nipka is the other one that really stands out. The stock is down almost 8% with no sign of uh, recovery. Though, of course, uh, the conference call commentary didn't seem too negative. I mean, the company is talking about FI25 uh, revenue growth of about uh, 105 to 11% versus 6% growth seen in the previous financial year. And it's guiding for a rise in margins as well. They're saying margins can go up to 21%. Uh, the year closed, the margins were at 19.3%. So not sure what's causing it, but it's a big gash on the stock. Prakash, do you track uh, Ipka? I, I missed out on the call, though. Uh, so, so I really don't mm. know uh, in terms of the granularity of what's uh, working against the stock. But, you know, before the call, when I'd spoken to some of the pharma-focused uh, analysts, the belief is that the... The Unicam acquisition is something which probably hasn't really uh, gone off as anticipated and it could be stretched. And that's that's probably, uh, you know, dragging down uh, things which otherwise look positive on the domestic uh, business and also there could be those issues. But as I said earlier, I haven't attended the call, so I really don't know anything specifically to this uh, move downwards. But uh, I would again believe it, it could be a mismatch in expectations. Uh, the management has been confident even in earlier calls, earlier quarterly earnings uh, have been fairly decent. There's no reason to worry. But then, of course, uh, you know, we are spoiled for choice these days. Uh, and, and that's how the street behaves if uh, something is not very, uh, very commensurate with their expectations. Hmm. You know, we're seeing a big move in Adani Group stocks, Prakash. Anything, uh, uh, you, you want to do so many stocks sp spotting there? Uh, you know, ports, of course, is the, I mean, I guess, easiest to uh, push but uh, what's, what's your view? No, so every time I see Adani Ports uh, doing better than uh, the previous session, you know, I actually keep looking at uh, JSW Infra because that's in the same space, growing in the same, you know, I mean, they, they're following the same copybook, uh, uh, you know, expansion story. And uh, they have uh, the capital, they have the cloud, they have the vision to kind of be a long-term player. I would believe this is something which will pay you off much better than Adani Ports now that uh, Adani Ports already reached a mature stage. You know, what's good about Adani Ports is that they are making your milestones, Prashant, with uh, the kind of capacity, the size of the vessels that they are managing, the transshipment uh, capability. So those things are getting now priced in because you know that this earnings growth or the revenue growth that they have blocked in the last 12 months is here to stay and, and get even firmer. But, uh, uh, you know, apart from Ports, I think the 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 big uh, the six story or unlocking potential lies in Adani Enterprises itself. Now, whether that happens uh, with the with the airport IPO getting carved out or whether it's something else out of that, but there's there's lots of promising businesses that are that have started seeing some traction. So I would believe uh, it will it will fetch some uh, institutional interest in a positive way uh, as and when they decide to raise capital. So let's let's look at that also. But of course, it's run up a bit uh, too sharply and then it has a little bit of history that you need to grapple with. But otherwise, I would believe Adani Enterprises also offers a very good opportunity to uh, track. Okay, all right. Uh, Prakash, what about Zomato? You know, McQuarrie came out of the note today. They have an underperformed rating. I think target price at sub 100 rupees. They are saying that Geomart could give them a run for its money and 
competitive intensity itself is uh, you know is creeping up in this space so the stock was down close to four and a half percent but in the last few minutes it's seen a recovery your view it's sub 180 rupees no, so I think if you look at Zomato Nigel with a five-year perspective, uh, this is, it's got the right to win in a market that it has created for itself. I mean, you look at, uh, you know, there was a time when the, the food delivery business had Swiggy as uh, the one adding to that so-called competitive intensity. Nothing much happened. Zomato went ahead and consolidated itself, you know, bought out Blinkit in its, of course, earlier avatar. And, and today, Blinkit is growing faster than anything else in the piece. So, uh, you know, for Geomart to be able to bring that kind of a scale and acceptance will take some time. And let me tell you, the market is big enough for even two large players to survive and do well. Uh, not just survive, but thrive. So I don't think uh, we need to overreact to that. Yes, competitive intensity will grow, but it's, it's like saying Indigo will suffer if uh, Air India grows. You know, I mean, the market is so massive that everybody has space to grow. So the point is who grows first? And from that perspective, I think Zomato still has some advantage. I would definitely recommend a buy, uh, but with a three to four year kind of a perspective where you could really see uh, it becoming the gorilla in the jungle. Uh, you know, right now it's just probably be a small player. Of, uh, the market is small, but the jungle itself would grow much larger. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> got that. Uh, you know, just a quick word, if you will. Do you track a company called Ice, Make, uh, uh, Ice Maker Refrigeration? I don't think we've discussed this in the past, but it's coming up with very large volumes. I think numbers came, stocks around 5%, 680. Oh, it's, so this started its journey uh, from the SME route. Uh, and of course, I, I used to track it more closely when it was much smaller. But now that it's kind of become part of the mainstream uh, listed space, you know, there is there is a lot of interest. Which are, I mean, we, we've seen uh, anecdotal evidence for uh, supporting the kind of growth expectations around this name. I mean, we had that during COVID uh, when, you know, vaccines and transportation logistics was a big question. Then you probably saw that in terms of uh, the way, you know, some of the food shortages were talked about. But I don't think there's anything specific except that it's in the right space. It has started getting scale. So if you evaluate this business from a slightly more secular perspective, it's definitely doing what, let's say, a snowman logistics would not fulfill in that sense. Of course, now it's part of the Adani group, but this would also at some point be part of some consolidation moves by some of the larger players, given the fact that to scale up, you need a lot of capital and a lot of uh, distribution muscle as well. They, they are, of course, on the engineering side, not on the logistics side, but they definitely are part of that chain uh, and, a, and a very good business. Uh, uh, Okay, I mean, you know, you, uh, there's an SME company in the same space, which is, I think, uh, called Markin Pharma, uh, which is now, I don't know when it will be listed, but I think it got a round of uh, funding, etc. They make refrigerators for medical use, for hospitals to keep samples, etc., as you mentioned. Uh, but very, of course, much smaller. It's just starting its uh, journey with regards to sort of coming to the public market and getting a proper round of funding, etc. Uh, but uh, we leave it there. Prakash, thanks very much uh, for uh, joining us. Good speaking with you. Thanks uh, for your time. We'll uh, take a quick commercial break here. We'll come back uh, with, uh, you know, more on the markets. Uh, Tushar Pradhan will also be with us, director at uh, HX Gone Partners on the other side. Stay with us. A younger, more diverse senior leadership team of insiders has managed to script the turnaround plan for the Mahindra Group, and it seems to be working. The Mahindra Group recently touched 3 lakh crore mark in terms of market capitalization, reported the highest ever profits, and has been the best performer on the Nifty 50. As a part of its growth plan, the company decided to fill almost all senior leadership positions through an internal promotion plan, and this has been done to reduce costs and also reduce employee attrition. How has this helped the group so far? Parikshit joins in to tell us more. Parikshit. Anisha, the managing director of the Mahindra Group, has set a target of achieving 5x growth for the company. One of the ways by which the group is hoping to achieve this is by focusing on internal hiring, as this helps the company reduce costs to a great extent. 
The Mahindra Group has decided to fill 90% of all senior positions through internal promotions in future. The company has established talent councils for each sector within the company to drive talent management and development. Currently, the average age of uh, the group executive board is 53. 25% of members have been inducted internally and 75% members have been inducted into the group executive board in the last five years. The company is making significant investments in grooming internal talent to rise to leadership positions within the company. Mahindra Group Managing Director Anish Shah himself was the group resident's strategy before being elevated to the post of Managing Director. Similarly, Rajesh Jajurikar was President Auto and Farm Sectors for five years before being elevated to Executive Director. More than 80 senior most employees have gone through Future Shapers program to groom them for future leadership positions in the company. Over 100 mid-level employees have gone through the Mahindra Accelerated Leadership Track program to prepare a bench strength of future leaders. The company has also partnered with Harvard and McKenzie for this training. Apart from Future Shapers and the Accelerated Leadership Track, the Mahindra Group has a She's on the Rise program to specifically mentor women employees for senior leadership roles in future. Mahindra Group believes this strategy has paid off and ensured diversity as well. 14 CXO roles have been filled up by women compared to just two or three earlier. Presence of women in the group corporate office has increased to 38% with a focused hiring approach. Two new women leaders have been uh, inducted into the group executive board of the company. The company has told CNBC TV18 that internal hiring and promotions have led to significant savings. External recruitment costs and relocation expenses have been reduced. Promotion of internal talent ensures business continuity in the Mahindra Group, less operational disruptions. Attrition at senior levels came down from 12% to 8% and female staff attrition has come down from 18% to 13% in FY24. CNBC TV18 has learned that the Mahindra Group expects significant cost reductions due to this strategy over the next two years. All right, uh, Parishad, that's an interesting story. Thanks very much uh, for that. You know, Nimesh, of course, was telling us about that report uh, with, I think it was Bank of America on Mahindra and Mahindra, putting a price target of over 3,000 rupees, 3,500 or so was that price target. We'll have the graphics up in a bit. Tushar Pradhan is with us, director at Hexagon Partners. Tushar, good to have you with us here. Good afternoon. I mean, you know, it's just a waiting game now uh, to tomorrow and then on Tuesday. Uh, your, 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 your thoughts, I mean, you know, markets, of course, building in uh, continuity, etc., uh, but the question really is, if you know you get the base case, is there a whole lot of upside here? Or do you think, as someone was suggesting uh, earlier, you know, we perhaps may just sort of fade the initial move after a day or two uh, because a lot is already in the price built in? Yeah, I, I will have to agree with you on that because uh, what has happened over time is that the markets have assimilated the uh, potential for the Indian economy over time and its valuations. So the event really is not going to drive or sustain the valuations to say that this is it. Uh, it is going to continue to fluctuate even after the markets uh, end after the, um, you know, the, the counting of the election is over. So that just will remain an event, which is like so many other events in the market. So I think an excessive focus on what happens on Monday and, you know, what is the, the tally etc. probably will last as excitement only for that day alone. And I'm sure that Tuesday will be another day where something else will become the focus. So I think uh, the overall understanding for most people in the market should be that what is the valuation? What are our average valuations? Are we more or less near where I would say fair value? And then take a call whether the expectation of returns from here on will really depend on the earnings growth that one can think of. So I think it is back to basics. Uh, the elections come and go. Uh, Mr. Pradhan, uh, afternoon. Reema here. Assuming political continuity, the last five years of the Modi government, the thrust was on manufacturing. And all the sectors and themes associated with manufacturing were the leaders in the rally. Do you think in the next five years it will be, you know, manufacturing theme which will continue to drive gains? Or is there going to be a change in what the thrust of the government is going to be, which could drive a new set of winners. 
Yeah, that's an interesting question because when you mentioned manufacturing uh, as an agenda, I think it was more led by the government itself. So we saw a lot of public sector capex. We saw a, a tremendous amount of capital expenditure in the budgets uh, per se. So the government itself put hard-earned money into infrastructure and real hard assets on the ground. Uh, there was always this issue about capital expenditure not being followed up by the private sector throughout this period. And I think what we're seeing is probably the cusp of a change from there on where the initial expenditure which the government has incurred is leading a lot of private capex to start coming through the system as of now. Because, for example, if you say what enthuses a private capitalist to start putting money in, one is, of course, demand. The other thing is infrastructure. And in the past, if you realize that India has had a pretty uh, challenging infrastructure set up, and I think if someone wants to put in money today, clearly he is looking at a better infrastructure environment than what he was even 10 years ago. So I think what we should probably see is manufacturing, as we call, uh, will shift from the basic manufacturing, which led to infrastructure production in the last few years, to having industrial manufacturing, uh, which is going to be led by secondary demand coming from the demographic dividend, as we call it, as well as all of these new initiatives that the government is taking in terms of allowing for electronics, uh, chip manufacture, and, and a different kind of hardware setup than what we've seen in the past. So I think manufacturing will continue to remain a theme, but the quality of what drove, uh, I would say, manufacturing and industrial activity in the last few years will change. Uh, and I think it will be in the favor of private manufacturing and industry going forward. That, that would be my understanding. Okay, all right. So perhaps uh, private capex indeed picking up, uh, that would be the expectation. By the way, the market uh, must point out, look at the bank nifty. It's suddenly surging almost six tenths of a percent. And that surge is uh, largely uh, due to HDFC Bank. That's the one big boy that's moved up almost a percent and a half. So Nifty Bank from those lows, the volatility, it's picked up. And HDFC Bank is responsible. It stays high on that one stock. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's still fairly quiet at the index level. Dushar, so since you're uh, you know, quite optimistic on, uh, on you know, local manufacturing, what are the ways to play it where valuations still leave some headroom on the table? I mean, there are multiple ways, right? You, you could look at uh, capital goods companies, you could look at infrastructure contractors, you could look at banks for that matter. So what's the best way to play this? Yeah, I mean, this is something which I think uh, some experience can come to your help. Uh, as we understand in the last uh, you know, period where we saw significant private capex come into the market, uh, there were companies which were into construction, into uh, manufacturing, which suddenly went up significantly from a multiple perspective in anticipation of the orders, et cetera, what, similar to what we are seeing today. Uh, I think one should not be phased by the fact that these valuations now are significantly higher than the average of the last five or six years, simply for the fact that what we are talking about is a sustained infrastructure and a manufacturing boost, which should last for the next two or three years minimum, which means that the volume and the momentum in earnings will continue beyond the next year. And if that is the belief that this is the kind of momentum that we are talking about, that these elevated valuations will come down as earnings rise. So as you know, the PE is a ratio between the price and the earnings. The earnings today are currently discounting only one year forward. So if you say that the earnings uh, should translate into, you know, having a valuation multiple incorporating two years or three years, then the valuation doesn't look that threatening. Of course, the confidence needs to be there that the momentum of earnings will continue. The order the flow that we are seeing today and the kind of orders that most of these companies have got will sustain over a period of time and incremental orders will also continue to accrue. If these assumptions are right, then I think there is a lot more steam to you know, even happen from here on. However, I must caution the fact that the kind of rise that we've seen in these companies, so maybe 100% in return over the last you know, uh, 18 months or so for most of these manufacturing companies on an average, will not translate into another 100% return from here on. But I think if we are able to be reasonable about our estimates for you know, how these companies will operate, I think a decent 15 to 20% average return from here on for the next two or three years 
cannot be said to be completely unrealistic at this time. Of course, there will be volatility along the way. But I'm saying this is the picture that one needs to keep, that one's expectation of returns should not be colored by the most recent past. It should incorporate a significantly higher earnings growth for the next few years, have the confidence that the markets readjust to, to reality over time, and it is not necessary that prices crash from here. It may just be that it will be a consolidating level, and as earnings keep growing up, you are going to be making money in the stock prices in line with earning growth from year on. So, so that would be my uh, guesstimate in terms of what's likely to happen from year on. All right. Uh, hi, Tushar. Good afternoon. Nigel on this side. Uh, you know, so since we've spoken enough about the event and its impact, let's look beyond the uh, event then. You know, telecom companies, they'll be waiting by for this tariff increase, which hasn't come in the last five years or so. And Vodafone idea, you know, that stock in the last few minutes has seen a bit of a spike up. And if Vodafone survives, then it's good news for Indestars as well. How do you approach the telecom pack? Because clearly, you know, a tariff increase is on the cards and that's post elections. Yeah, well, that's something that I'd like to not take a call on because uh, essentially tariffs... Uh, uh, are a factor which impacts everyone in the economy. And I don't think there is going to be that much of, uh, you know, uh, incentive for tariffs to go up just because they think that they should go up. I think there is a case to be made that India continues to have the lowest telecom tariffs anywhere in the world. Uh, I think all of the companies have demonstrated that they've been fair to their customers over a period of time and that they deserve uh, you know, an increase of tariff or a reduction on in some of the, uh, I would say, charges that the government, uh, you know, proposes to have on, on some of these telecom companies. So whether it is a reduction of these, whether it is an allowance for a higher tariff to happen, whichever way you look at it, uh, I think there is enough case to say that this will happen. But it's not a done deal. And I think over a period of time, uh, everyone should realize that we do operate in a very, very low tariff environment, especially for for our uh, customers across compared to any part of the world. And as uh, the ability to afford these services increases across the economy, I think there will be you know, enough reason for the government to uh, kind of look at the tariff situation and then allow for some uh, increases in tariffs. If that does happen, uh, clearly there is a tremendous increase uh, for profitability across the, the spectrum in this sector simply because it's an extremely high capital intensive, um, you know, operationally leveraged business, which means at any point of time that you have a uh, allowance for an increase in tariff, it, it hits your bottom line very quickly. However, having said that, uh, technology in this uh, area is extremely intensive in the sense that after 5G, after 6G, you will continue to have to invest in the business going forward. So which means your ROEs will definitely temper the fact that your increase in profits is going to be, you know, in some way balanced by the kind of investments that you will need to make after the significant profits that you make. So, so I think all in all, uh, I would think telecom just like any other business to be looked at, all gains here. And for every uh, tariff increase that you can expect from here, uh, we just have to temper it by the fact that there may be some potential capex uh, which will continue to happen in this industry. Okay, Tushar, thank you very much uh, for joining in. By the way, the telecom spectrum auctions also begin next week on the 6th of June. It's not likely to be a big event, uh, you know, just purely based on the earnest money deposited by the telcos. It appears that it's going to be a fairly muted bidding, limited bidding, selective bidding uh, this time around. So it may not be such a big trigger. But by the way, the MSCI rebalancing impact is taking place. Look at the way stocks like Jindal Stainless now up 12 percent. PB Fintech, a 10 percent up move on that. Torrent Power. Zomato was in the red through the course of the trading session, but now is back in the green. So these are stocks where you are seeing inclusions, weightages going up, and the stocks are reacting to that. So that MSCI rejig impact is playing out in the last 30 minutes. I'll get into a break. On the other side, we'll get you a check on what Dealing Rooms is saying in our segment, D Street Chatter. We also get you a few BTSD calls. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Well, the markets are flattish with plenty of action from the broader markets. You have that MSCI rejig that's taking place, which is uh, making stocks fly around. You have a few stocks actually that have slipped to the low point of the day. Trent is down close to 3%. 
Tata LXC is down close to around you know four percent now as we speak. So some of these stocks are getting knocked back, and Havels is one of the big movers on the upside. Stock flying away as we speak. In today chart comes up for you in the screen. But a good time to go to D Street Chatter. Nimesh joins us. Uh, Nimesh, I mean uh, the event is almost here. Uh, positions have got lightened, I think so, and I think a lot of H and I's retail. You know, they are waiting on the sidelines yeah. and let this event get out of the way. You know, it looks like this is a classical edge on your seat kind of a thriller, right? Nobody knows what's going to come yeah. in the exit poll. Nobody knows what's going to come on fourth in terms of actual numbers. So it's a, it's a wild guess. You know, I've been talking to a lot of uh, larger h and uh, institutional clients as well. And, and everybody's having a guesswork. Nobody knows exactly what the number is going to be. I guess what's happening in the last 30 minutes is the MSCI changes, changes. which is why a lot of individual names are reacting to the, to the flows either on the negative side or on the positive, positive side. But the big number is the $2.5 billion of inflows because of this MSCI rejig. So the institutional data may look quite large, large. in today's market. Uh, I guess, uh, you know, uh, as I said, you know, the, the big event is, is next week. But we've seen a bit of traction back in the PSU names. Uh, a lot of metal stocks are buzzing in trade. And of course, the Adani group is, 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 is also buzzing in trade. So looks like there is a bit of hope that maybe what market wants, that kind of result will come, uh, come Monday and Tuesday. So that's something to watch out for. But I guess... Uh, Today's last 30 minutes is going to be all individual names mm. because of this MSA, MSA reject. Okay, all right. That's about MSA reject, but you'll have some individual stocks as well that you normally track for us, Nimesh. Tell That's us right. about them. So, in terms of individual names, the first stock is car trade technologies. The trend of, uh, you know, the PEs and promoter selling just continues. So, again, today was a large block. The stock is under pressure after 4% equity call change hands. And I understand the private equity investor was a seller in today's block. So, again, disclosures will be quite interesting there. The second name is Gale. Within the PSU name, this is one stock where we saw some multiple block deals in today's trade. I understand some large H&I investors were buyers uh, in, in that block. So, again, you know, some bit of traction is back in PSUs and Gale stands out for that. The third name is TVS Motors. Some bit of selling pressure has emerged at these levels in TVS Motors. So, uh, there, is high, there is delivery based selling happening at FIDS. So, expect high delivery volumes there. And the last one is Ramkrishna Forging. Been, been completely on the, on, the, on the consolidation mode, uh, been very range bound, but looks like some bit of buying has emerged for the last couple of days. Even in today's market, though small, but there is delivery based buying in RK Forging. Okay, well, interesting list as always, Nimesh. Thanks for that. You know, I just want to quickly put up these MSCI uh, additions. This is additions to the standard index. They all go into effect from today. And uh, you'll be able to see the reaction. Vivek, of course, has been telling about this. The stocks are also, some of them are at the bottom of the screen. But if we have these, we should just uh, pull, yeah, there you go, on your screen. Look at the moves coming through. PB Fintech is up 9%. NHPC is up uh, 5 uh, Phoenix, not very much, but I think it's run up over the last couple of days. There is a lot of pre-positioning which also happens ahead of something like this. Inda, Solar Industries, Torrent Power, or uh, more names. There is JSL, I mean, General Stainless, which is seeing a 12% pop. Thermax and Bosch uh, then. And then you've got uh, Mankind, which is seeing a large move. Uh, and uh, you've got, okay, Mankind is up too, it was up uh, much more. JSW Energy and Canada Bank are some of the others. So this is, you know, uh, the MSCI uh, aspect playing out uh, in, into close. 17 minutes to go for close uh, is uh, where we are at uh, this point in time. Well, you know, uh, as we sort of go forward, there is, of course, going to be uh, a lot of uh, focus on macros as well. Later today, we get the GDP numbers. But, you know, we'll talk about GDP numbers in a bit in terms of what to expect, etc. But before that, we want to talk about gold and how the Reserve Bank of India has brought back a little over 100 tons of gold from the UK back to the country. Gold that we own, the RBI has you know, as part of its reserves, which was stored elsewhere, being brought back uh, to the country. So it's an interesting development. And uh, uh, who else but Lata is here uh, to take us through it. Lata, first of all, welcome back. Uh, it's <laughs> been a you. bit of a break and <laughs> yeah. uh, you're back now. Just yes, in time, GDP, yes. elections, <laughs> plenty going on. Absolutely. <laughs> Actually, any day in uh, being a reporter in uh, India is great. Okay, let me uh, come to the Reserve Bank's uh, uh, bringing back gold. Uh, they brought back 100 tons, which means that out of their total 800 tons which they own, they used to own five, hold 500 in foreign vaults and 300 at home. Now it is becoming 400, 400. So 50, 50. Okay. Now the reason why they keep gold outside is that uh, first of all, you buy in global markets, so it's easy to store it there. Though people will be ready to deliver it even to India, you keep it there so that you can trade do swaps, deposits, etc. But since the amount is so much, the Reserve Bank believes that it's not going to use so much uh, to swap and for trading purposes, and therefore it's bringing back what is not needed. You know, there is an underlying feeling that is it because, you know, Russian deposits were uh, suddenly de-recognized by the US. Uh, but uh, at least my source doesn't uh, think that uh, that's not the official reason. The reason is that why should it lie abroad? 
for whatever we use it, we will keep. The remaining can be brought back. So chances are, even of the balance 400, some more may come back. Uh, the other uh, point I want to make is that how did gold get there? Uh, the uh, first time that gold was shipped abroad was in 1991 when there was this expectation that we may renege on default on our IMF loan. And so this was sent as, uh, you know, collateral. 65 tons were sent, for, uh, about 20 tons of gold confiscated and 45 tons of RBI's own gold. So that was held in vaults abroad. And then they thought that next time you buy, why ship it here? Let it be held over there. You know, it's a cost advantage. And there are these professional guys who, you know, uh, depositories who do it for you. Uh, this one, of course, is at RBI's cost because it was our gold which we held abroad and we are bringing it back. So this cost has to be borne. It's airlifted normally. Uh, not, uh, uh, there's no other cost. Okay, there are some reports which say that a tax had to be paid. No, why? Why customs? I mean, it's our own gold. It's only a change in location. So there is no GST, no tax, nothing. Also, there is no change to India's you know, economy or RBI's balance sheet in any way because it was always there on the balance sheet. First time in the last so many years that uh, we are shipping it back? We are shipping it back. After the historic 1991... After the 1991 uh, sending of the gold, yeah. this is the first time it's coming back. And now I think more tranches will come. Okay. okay. What about uh, GDP? What should we expect today evening? Well, uh, GDP, I wanted to make one point. You know, our poll says that it might be 7.8 and the NSO's own expectation is 7.6. Last year, we did 7%. Uh, 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 Q4, the ex our poll says about 6.6, 6.7. Now, I want to say that, uh, that if you remember in Q3, there was a huge difference between GDP and GVA. GDP came at 8.4, but GVA was only 6.5. That is the real economic activity. So you can get the 7.8, maybe we will even get an 8%. But let us look at the GVA number. Now, why this big divergence happened is because year ago, that is FY23, there was a large amount of subsidies and that did not exist in uh, last year's Q, in this uh, FY24 Q3 and GVA does not include those subsidies. In GDP, it is included. That's why GDP looks very big, but the actual economic activity is only 6.5% last quarter, that is Q3. Q4, our poll is throwing up a number of only 59 so we must remember that, that GVA is the number we have to look at. Now, economists are deeply divided. In our poll, we had many people at 7.2 uh, for the Q4, and we had many people at 6.5, 6.4. Why uh, the difference? Because you don't know whether there will be another big, you know, subsidy impact on the GDP. The, uh, it's a toss of a coin. Some economists believe that, yes, once again, a very low subsidy compared to a year ago, will make the GDP look good and the GVA look lower. And there are some who say, no, no, all the adjustment is over in the third quarter and the difference will be only, as always, you know, about 30, 40 uh, uh, basis points between GDP and GVA. So even if it is 8%, please, I must request all of you to look at the GVA number, which is the real growth number. One more point. I did a poll asking people about FY25. If the election threw up another very strong government, which is the base case. Everyone said that they are not going to change their numbers for FY25 if the G uh, uh, NDA romps home with as good a majority as last time. But they will definitely change it if it is a much lower number. All right, uh, Lada, thank you very much. Uh, so that's the uh, uh, sort of uh, GDP numbers and what to expect. GVA, uh, as Lada said. As the more important More number. important number. And, uh, you know, she'll be with you a little later in the evening as we decipher the numbers as they come through. Well, uh, let's just quickly run you through uh, some of the near-term sort of trading action as we see it. By the way, the Nifty's also picked up uh, pace. So we're up about back about 90 points or so. Kush Bora is back with us uh, with, uh, you know, short-term trading ideas. Kush... Uh, uh, this is uh, going to be an interesting one. What do you have in terms of short-term trades? Well, it took us a while to figure out how, you know, how to play <laughs> the index, <laughs> given the options premium. But I think, you know, what we discussed either at the beginning of the show, which is, you know, go long on the Nifty futures and buy the 20 to 200 uh, put option for the June 6 expiry. That's the best way to play the index. A similar strategy, a strategy can be implemented on the uh, bank Nifty as well. You could go long on the futures and a 48,000 uh, put option can be bought. Now, as far as stocks go, because of, uh, you know, the nature of the event, it's best to perhaps avoid. But if someone still wants to go ahead and do it, then, you know, I have a head strategy, which is Ashok Leland. It's looking good. The recovery, uh, you know, is underway. 
that should uh, be considered on the long side where your targets would be 230 and 236 and 218 is a stop loss but along with that also consider a short position on Wipro which is below the 200 day moving average attempting a recovery but might just fizzle out so 430 and 422 will be your targets on the downside but keep a strict stop loss at the 450 mark Okay, go long, Ashok Leyland and short Wipro. Thank you, Kush, for joining in. The Nifty is back above 22,550, but still some distance away from our intraday high, which was 22,650. Get into a break. We'll come back with more Market Talk. Welcome back. You're with us in the last leg of closing bell as the market gears up for, for the all-important exit poll outcome first of the weekend and then the real event next week. And it's been really volatile, really choppy in a 150-point band, but it's been going all over the place. And it looks like uh, the Nifty wants to go home above the 20 DMA, but let me not uh, you know say too much. Still nine minutes to go. We have Hemang Jani with us on this leg of the show. Hemang, you know, it's uh, you know, really nerves out there. But uh, you tell us, I mean, the last couple of weeks, there's been so much chatter about Modi stocks, CapEx, infra plays, all of the parts of the market that have done really well. Would you still expect that outperformance to continue, irrespective of what happens on the 4th of June? Good afternoon, Surabhi. I think uh, the market has, in a way, uh, you know, started uh, discounting uh, what probably may happen on 4th and, uh, of course, on exit uh, polls also. As you can see that, you know, certain uh, uh, stocks have already started moving. Uh, but surely, uh, once the event uh, plays out uh, as per market expectations or otherwise, you will surely see some impact because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the market will be positioned in a certain way. And on the day of the election, uh, certain uh, flows and certain, uh, you know, uh, investments people do make basis the outcome. So, uh, having seen this kind of a move, uh, depending upon finally how many seats and what kind of margins, uh, you know, uh, do we see, you will see some outperformance in pockets like PSUs, Adani Group, Cement, so on and so forth. Mm. Is the move in the Adani Group stocks telling you the way the market thinks the exit poll outcome is likely to be? Look at Adani Power, 9%, Total Gas, 9%, Enterprises up 7%. Ports, of course, are part of the Nifty, so that's up close to about 4%. But across the board, big gains. Amongst the Adani Group stocks, which one would you bet on? I think the, the best in terms of, uh, you know, so, so there are two ways to look at it. One is that you just want to play as an event and, and the, the high beta name would be Adani Enterprise, Adani uh, Green, uh, Adani Power. Uh, but if you really uh, want to look at it more as a you know investment bet apart from the election event, then of course Adani Port is something that we think is 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 fundamentally uh, much better in terms of you know the the entire story, growth, valuations, etc. Mm, okay, Adani Ports would be your pick then. By the way, looking at some more stocks in the move uh, as the market has perked up, the mid cap index now by the way is up about six tenths of a percent. So let's very quickly. Spot some more stocks. Med Plus is soaring high, 5.5% higher. A couple of uh, Tier 2 banks and also PSU Tier 2 banks. When Union Bank, for instance, 5.5% on the higher side. There is a CMS Info Systems suddenly up uh, over 5%. These are last-minute moves that are coming in, very sharp and rapid moves at that. Uh, there is a BSE, which now is clocking a gain of nearly 6%. So very interesting trades playing out in the mid-cap market as well. Uh, Hemang, uh, any interest in any of the stocks that I'm naming? All of them are surging right now. Med Plus, BSC, CMS Info Systems. So, Surbi, I think uh, some of the names are because of the MSCI flows in the last half an hour, particularly, you know, something like uh, uh, Jindal Stainless, NHPC, Torrent Power, etc. Uh, Med Plus, I think, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, if you look at the way the entire diagnosis space, the numbers have been good and, and, and there have been certain blocks in last two or three days. So it is something to do with that. Uh, PSC has been uh, uh, going through a bit of a correction because of the possible action that, you know, SEBI and government may take, you know, for, for you know, like the, the way the retail participation was growing. Uh, there was some... Uh, you know, action that was likely. But uh, I think, uh, you know, maybe uh, because of the event, you will see that action. But the larger move will happen once we have clarity on that. 
Okay. Any thoughts on uh, BSC? Big move in the last few minutes over there. Yeah, Rima. So I was saying that uh, you know hmm. the post numbers, the stock was subdued, and now today we are seeing action. I don't think there is any specific news flow today. But a larger call can be taken only post we have clarity on what kind of action the SEBI or the government may take so that the retail participation is not as high. Okay. And what about PSU banks? Uh, uh, post the numbers now, what do you, what's the thought process of PSU banks versus private sector banks? Clearly, uh, when you look at the numbers, uh, the PSU banks by and large have delivered better numbers, particularly State Bank of India, uh, Canara Bank, uh, the numbers have been good. And uh, I don't think, uh, you know, uh, people are too much worried. Once the event is out of the way, you might see a catch up because the smaller PSU banks, when you look at the numbers, uh, they have delivered much better set of numbers. So I think uh, there is going to be interest uh, post-election and uh, there can be certain degree of outperformance with the v private banks. Mm. Uh, Hemang, there was this Titan analyst meet which was taking place today. Have you picked up any chatter from what's transpired there, what the management had to say? So in case of uh, Titan, what is coming out uh, very clearly is that the near term, uh, the growth in the core jewelry business could be slightly, uh, you know, subdued uh, because the volume growth is not that great and the gold prices by and large have remained strong. And the newer businesses where they have invested, there the growth is not looking that great. So I think next couple of quarters, the growth uh, will remain slightly subdued. But I think uh, Titan does go through a bit of a you know 10 12 percent kind of a correction from a certain valuations and all but uh, as a core story we don't see any uh, concern over there because of the credibility the way they have you know have put in place the distribution and the demand for uh, jewelry gold uh, in a country like India will continue to you know grow at a certain pace so no concerns as such on time mm, okay. Finally, Imang, there's been so much back and forth on life insurance, right? And what's happening with these surrender value norms and when they're coming, not coming, are they good, are they bad? Is there another sort of reversal or not? All things put together, how are you looking at these stocks? So to avoid, uh, anyway, the sector was not performing. If you look at the data points last, let's say, one year, two year, uh, you know, by and large, if you leave aside the general insurance part, these, uh, you know, life insurance companies are not delivered. And on top of that, you have, you know, these kind of, uh, you know, uncertainty around the norms, what will happen. So I think best to avoid, you have plenty of opportunities in uh, banks, NBFCs. So uh, I think, uh, you know, worth avoiding at this point. By the way, the mid-cap index is moving up, up and away. It's now a 0.7% gain on the mid-cap index. It's at the day's high. Uh, and even the advanced decline ratio, the gap between the two is narrowing very rapidly as we uh, speak. Um, just uh, thank you very much, uh, Hemang, for joining in. We are wrapping up uh, the day's trading action and also for the week. And it's ending Friday on a positive note ahead of the exit poll verdict. But through the week, the markets have been very, very nervous. For the week, we've lost more than 1% on the benchmark indices. But as I said, on Friday, we managed to bounce back from the early lows and close up around the 22,515 mark, uh, defending that 20-day moving average. Midcaps outperformed on Friday, but for the week there was caution which prevailed and the midcap index was down close to about 1.2% for the entire week. Uh, the big gainers include the Adani Group stocks, a special mention to Adani Enterprises, Ports and outside of that, banks. So ICICI Bank, State Bank of India or even an HDFC Bank, a relative outperformance coming through on the banks. Absolutely. I mean, uh, for the week as well, uh, real estate, metal, all of these stocks have uh, pulled up. But if you are, uh, you know, looking at the tally, I mean, for the day that is, but if you're looking at the tally for the week, then the week started with a lot of weakness on the PSU names. Some recovery towards the end of it. Let's quickly talk about the movers and shakers then. The bell has gone. Uh, on the, on the uh, mid-cap side of the market, the result casualties include a Wellspin Corp down 9%, Apecar down 8%. We saw some late selling in Tube Investments, very sharp selling, 3-3.5% lower there as well. On the upside, a lot of the MSCI inclusions, either in the Standard Index or in the Small Cap Index, lots of stocks bouncing around. So Sundaram Finance, for instance, was up and about. Uh, there were moves on Suzla on Energy, which is also getting added into one of those indices. The uh, Thermax was the other one, up about 2%.
the entire adani group was active not just in the large cap nifty adani stocks but in the, even the other names look at uh, adani power adani total gas 8 9% on some of these names uh, blue star you heard from the management earlier in the morning as well sounding quite optimistic on uh, you know sizzling summer season ac sales that stock has ended with a gain of about uh, 6 odd percent so all in all not a bad session should mention here that the uh, the vix has spiked in a significant way this week as well uh, the india vix up almost 14% as uh, the intense sort of speculation and the nerves peak out as we get into the final stage of the results But with that it's a wrap on this edition of closing bell thank you very much for watching but don't go anywhere all the action continues up next as editors round table